Hi, Matt here. You may remember my iconic roles as Ryan Reynolds' Asian version, Asian Keanu Reeves with British accent, or Discount Markiplier. But in my free time, there's nothing I like more than to kick back, relax, and mod LEGO Island. Yes, for many of us, LEGO Island is the pinnacle of nostalgia. As a kid, you may have even been convinced that the island wasn't as tiny as it really is. It's so small, you can actually cross the entire thing in less than a minute. No joke. It only was like that in real life. But if you've decided to check out the game again, after 20 or so years to see if that's true, you're bound to discover something else almost immediately. The game is a little harder to control than you remember. But this one isn't rose-tinted nostalgia glasses, this one is actually for real. Let's look at how the game worked on a computer of the era. This is a PC from the year 2000, featuring a whopping 500MHz AMD K62 with an SIS530 graphics chip. Pretty mid-range for the era LEGO Island was developed in, and you probably don't even have to play it, you can see it's way more maneuverable. Yes, we sacrifice most of the frames per second, but pretty much all of the game's development and testing would have been done on computers about this good or worse, so believe it or not, in a way, this is how the game was intended to be played. But you can actually see here the root problem, as I pan around to face away from all the 3D geometry of the island and back. The frame rate speeds up and slows down, and so does the turning along with it. Basically, the game turns at a constant rate every frame, which means one thing when the frame rate is under 20, and another thing when the frame rate is over 90. This is your everyday modern computer, well up to the task of running LEGO Island at its maximum frame rate. As you can see, the turn speed is frustrating to say the least. This is the unfortunate burden of anyone who even attempts to speedrun this game. And there's not much you can do about it, except for use the frankly weird mouse controls instead, which do at least give you some analog control instead of just using the maximum speed like the keyboard controls do. So how could the developers not have known this was an issue? Well, the truth is that they did. Sort of. According to a recent interview with lead programmer Dennis Goodrow, they discovered the bug but only after they'd started printing and shipping the discs. He says, One regret I have is that we didn't find machines that were fast enough to reveal a bug in the input algorithm. If you run the game on the much faster machines of today, the method we used causes major oversteer. Jim Brown realized this after release and worked out a very simple fix, but the product CDs had been made and shipped and Mindscape never made an attempt to get a fix out. So basically, the developers did know about the issue and even took it upon themselves to fix it, but it was just too late for the management at Mindscape to care about it. Probably because they were already planning to fire the whole team to get out of paying the bonuses they promised them and continuing to pay their salaries in general. I didn't make that up by the way, that really happened. So 23 years later, we're at the inevitable conclusion of this issue. All computers today can play the game at its maximum frame rate significantly faster than it was back in the day and much less playable as a result. With no official patch in sight and the original source code most likely lost forever, what can we, the community, do about it now? Lay, lay, lay. Go. As we've established, the game was clearly targeted for the average computer performance of the era, and was unfortunately not fully future-proofed for computers that were significantly faster. So the most obvious conclusion is to simply recreate that performance by manually limiting the frame rate of the game. And there are a number of ways to do this, but probably the most streamlined is a simple mod to the game itself. On startup, it sets a minimum frame delta, which is just a geeky way of saying the minimum amount of time, usually in milliseconds, that should pass between one frame and the next. This is usually done to implement a frame rate cap. Let's say we wanted to limit a game to 30 frames per second. That's one frame roughly every 33 milliseconds, making 33 a minimum frame delta. During gameplay, after we're done rendering a frame, we can check how long it took to do so. And if it was less than 33, let's say it took 10, then rather than barrel along rendering the next frame, we can simply pause execution for 23 milliseconds before starting the next one, which keeps our frame rate consistent and prevents the game from gobbling up all the system resources that it can. To the player, this pause is usually imperceptible, except for some pro gamers who prefer no frame rate cap at all. In LEGO Island, the minimum delta is 10 milliseconds, which basically means the frame rate will never exceed 100 FPS. If we want to reduce the frame rate, all we have to do is increase the minimum delta to increase the pause between frames. Around 10 to 15 FPS, or around 66 to 100 delta, feels about the same as the old PC from earlier, and similarly you can see how much easier the game is to maneuver. This does indeed give you a relatively authentic experience of how this game would look and feel at the time. 
but I'll be the first to admit, it kind of sucks, right? No one wants to play a game at 15 FPS, even if the game is as old as this one is. So unless we really want to pretend that our i7s are Pentium 2s, it's back to the drawing board. Play, play, play. Go. But you don't have to be Bill Gates to know that the game must store a number somewhere to determine how fast the player should turn. Indeed, LEGO Island does. Specifically, it stores a maximum speed value. Using the mouse, we can see the range from 0 to the maximum speed at the very edge of the screen. And wouldn't you know it, the keyboard has none of this range, it's just 0 or maximum speed at all times. But if we could somehow isolate the maximum speed and lower it, this would improve the controls without slowing the game and its frame rate down. This value is actually relatively easy to find. It's a 32-bit single precision floating point number, which basically means it's a decimal number, and it defaults to 20. Knowing this, we can effectively replace it with any number we want, and I found that reducing it to about 6 or 7, you know, roughly a third of the normal value, seems about right. Doing this makes the controls feel so much better, and you didn't have to sacrifice any FPS to do it. It's honestly game-changing, fun fully intended, making the nigh unplayable controls work just as well in this day and age as they did over 20 years ago. In many ways, this solves the problem, and has been the solution for the past year or so. But while this is a patch that generally works for most people most of the time, it isn't perfect. Not by a long shot. Play, play, play. Go. Speaking of long shots, this solution is a little different from the others. Unlike the other two, it doesn't involve simply editing a number somewhere, this actually involves adding extra code to the game that didn't exist before. However, it would be, hands down, the most ideal, in fact, it would be the perfect solution. The problem with simply reducing the turn speed or reducing the frame rate is that they're kind of band-aid solutions. They don't address the root problem of the turn speed being tied to the frame rate. So we still technically have the problem where if the frame rate ever slows or fluctuates for any reason, the turning speed will change with it. That also means different turn speed values will feel different depending on how powerful the computer it's running on is. When I say 6 or 7, that won't necessarily apply to all computers. No, the ultimate way to fix this would be to use very similar code to the minimum frame delta code I mentioned earlier, where we calculated how much time each frame took to render. Last time we used it to limit the frame rate, but we can also use delta time simply as a means to track the passage of time. While all of our calculations still occur once per frame, knowing how long the frame took means we can rebase all our calculations around, well, time, rather than at the same rate every frame, a frame that could take literally any amount of real world time. This is in fact what all games should do, and if you ever see a game's frame rate drop and start to feel noticeably more sluggish as well, it's probably because the developers have forgotten or otherwise neglected to do it. But in all fairness, this is a mistake that developers continue to make to this day. So it's understandable that developers 23 years ago wouldn't necessarily have had future proofing on their minds. Or did they? Play, play, play. Go. So we've gone over pretty much all three ways this problem can be fixed, leaving only one question. What would the aforementioned, never released official patch have been? Obviously, since the patch was never released and the source is most likely lost for good, we'll never know for sure, but looking at the evidence, we may get a pretty good idea. Now, there's only one real solution here, but is that the one we would have gotten? Now, they definitely wouldn't have decreased the speed, because that would have made no sense on the computers of the era. But would they have just limited the frame rate? There's actually a surprising amount of evidence that this could have been the official fix, the biggest one being that they kind of already did. See, it's not just the turn speed that's ruined by faster hardware. There are also a handful of animations that are tied to the frame rate and also run too fast. At least they do in hardware mode. For reasons not entirely understood, if you set the graphics to any of the three software modes, the game will limit a handful of sections to 30 FPS. These do indeed make the animations much more fluid, and the turning actually feels pretty good too. I actually think they probably targeted the animations at least to run at 30 FPS, and it does seem like a 30 FPS cap would have solved pretty much all of the issues. Given the context, it's easy to see this limiting as maybe just a quick hack to stop the animations from running too fast, and it was enough to convince me that that might have been the intended solution as a whole. But there were some problems with this assumption. 
The biggest one being we've already seen how easy it is to implement a frame rate cap for the whole game. If they intended to cap everything, why go to the extra effort of capping only some places in some situations? That in itself seems to indicate that there were other reasons that those areas were locked. Additionally, why implement a 30fps cap considering most computers of the era couldn't even reach 30fps with this game? It would take years before that fix would actually start to help anyone at all. It didn't add up. It didn't seem logical that this would have been the official solution. So, assuming the developers are sensible, that really only leaves one option. Would this have been the patch we were blessed with had the management allowed its release? Well, after digging through the code, I can pretty confidently say that yes, it would have been. And the reason why is because, once again, they already kinda did. Lay, lay, lay. Go. We've spent a lot of time talking about the turn speed, but almost none talking about the walking speed. If I put the old PC and the new PC side by side once again, you'll notice the walking actually isn't any faster on the newer machine. Looking at the assembly code, sure enough, the walking speed does use a delta time calculation exactly as we described, determining how much time has passed since the last frame and adjusting the speed accordingly. In other words, they did exactly what they were supposed to do to unhook walking from the frame rate. So did they just forget about the turning? Well, not exactly. Walking in the game uses a kind of velocity system. In other words, you don't just start and stop, you gradually accelerate and decelerate. And it looks like they initially intended to do the same thing with turning, gradually accelerating and decelerating. At some point, they disabled that functionality, which is good because for kicks, I re-enabled it and it really sucks. Rather than accelerating to a value, the turning is just immediately set to the target speed so that the feedback is instant and responsive. But wouldn't you know it, since the velocity turning used the same code as the walking, once upon a time, the turning was unhooked from the frame rate as well. When they chose to just use the target speed directly, they forgot to do any delta time adjustment to that speed. It is nothing short of poetic irony that in a legitimate and largely successful attempt to improve the controls, they also happen to introduce the worst control bug of the entire game. It's no wonder that Dennis Goodrow said it was a quick fix. It was literally one line of code that would have had to change. But knowing this, Knowing how simple this bug was in reality, I present to you the unofficial, official turn speed patch. Here's how it plays normally, way too fast at the maximum frame rate and vastly slower at lower frame rates, and here's the patch, with speeds identical regardless of the frame rate. It's here, it's real, and I'm very happy to see this bug actually resolved once and for all. And I can't even really take the credit for it because they already did all the hard parts. All I did was finish it. So you may be wondering, how can you try these out? Well, they're all in my modding tool called LEGO Island Rebuilder. Everything from adjusting the maximum speeds to limiting the frame rate to the brand new edition of unhooking the turn speed entirely. Check it out in the description down below if you'd like some extra fun with your LEGO Island session. Anyways, that is all from me, but if you're interested in LEGO Island modding, feel free to hit subscribe because I have a lot of cool stuff planned for the future. In any case, thank you so much for watching and I will see you all in the next video.